Hi you guys, I hope you're doing well. I used to do this series on my channel called Skincare Sundays, but I realized there's so much that I wanna talk about besides skincare within science that I am revamping the series and it's going to be called Science Sundays. And every Sunday you will get a video where you and I will discuss a science-based topic. And with that being said, today's video is going to be one that I've had a lot of requests for. And it's the topic of hair loss. Okay, so hair is a sensitive subject. It's a symbol of our identity. And for men and women across history and philosophy and religion, it has again and again been seen as a symbol of self-esteem and value. For women specifically, hair has been referred to as the crowning glory in biblical texts. There is this image of Lady Godiva riding horseback with nothing but her hair covering her body, and that was used as a symbol of both beauty and civic freedom. In the 1950s, female communists in China actually came up with the term liberation hairdo, which is a really, really short haircut used as a sign of them taking back control over their own lives. And then for men, both head hair and facial hair is the primary indicator of their biological status and their manliness and their self-confidence. My own journey with hair has been so tumultuous. I grew up in a Pakistani household and so tail malish or oil massage was a regular part of our routine and I used to reluctantly aka by force, <laughs> have it done on a weekly basis. Um, every weekend my mom would sit and put oil in my hair and eventually I started doing it myself. So I only really appreciated what that was doing for the state of my hair later on in life. But I especially realized it when I lost majority of my hair when I was 17 years old due to an illness. Um, and I will never forget this period of my life because there were so many things going on with my health, but as far as my hair was concerned, it was just falling off in chunks. I would run my fingers through it and my fingers would be covered in oh, so many strands of hair. And there's this one moment in time that sticks out to me and it's when I was sitting in my residence and because I was so sick, I was too weak to even comb my hair. So I would sit on the floor and my roommates would comb my hair for me. And I remember them talking to me and we were laughing and then all of a sudden they went quiet and they stopped responding. And when I turned around to see why they weren't talking, it was three of them on my bed. Um, they were not talking because chunks of my hair was falling out in their hands. And it got to this point where so much of it fell out that when it started regrowing, when I would lift my hair like this, you would see the new hair growth and it was a centimeter and then an inch and then longer and then longer and then longer until the length of my hair was so thin and wispy and the thickness of it had grown out to about here. Um, I actually have a picture, I'll insert it. And at that point I went and I cut off all the ends that I was holding on to because it was like a safety blanket. Like I said, there were so many things going on with my health, but we have a meaningful relationship with our hair and uh, it was hard to let go of. It was hard to watch it all fall out. And so at that point is when I realized I need to do something, mayday, there's something going wrong and I need to do something to help myself. And that is when I first gained an understanding of how to help my hair stop falling out and also regrow. So to understand why hair actually falls out, we have to understand how it grows. And so we're gonna start by breaking down the growth cycle of hair. Um, there's three main cycles or phases that hair goes through. They're called anagen, catagen, and telogen. So anagen is the active phase of hair and it lasts about three to five years. And in this phase, the cells within the root of the hair follicle are dividing rapidly and hair will grow roughly half an inch to an inch per month. The hair on our brows, our lashes, our body, that all has a much shorter antigen phase and so that's why those hairs are always naturally much shorter than the hair on our head. So once this phase ends, we enter the catagen phase and this is really just a transitional phase lasting two to three weeks and it just signals the end of the active phase before we move on to the telogen phase. So the telogen phase is the at rest phase and this is where the cells stop dividing and the hair falls out. 
and it's completely normal within the telogen phase to lose anywhere from 50 to 100 strands of hair per day. Hairs in the telogen phase actually have a really unique characteristic and if you pull out a strand of your hair, if you look at the base of it, the root, if you see a white bulb, that hair was in telogen phase. It was going to shed anyways. But if the bulb is surrounded by this gel-like covering, that hair was not in telogen phase and it was growing. This phase only lasts for about three months before entering the antigen phase again. And so the antigen phase is exponentially longer than either of the other two phases. There is something, however, that increases the activity within the telogen phase, and that is something called telogen effluvium. Certain traumatic experiences can cause hair loss far beyond what is normal, and these things can include weight loss or weight gain, high fevers, infections, um, changes in your mental health, medication changes. All these things will cause an early end to the antigen phase and shift far more hairs into the telogen phase than would otherwise be normal. You will notice the results of all these hairs entering telogen phase in telogen effluvium about six weeks after that insult. And six to nine months later, it should resolve itself. But if it doesn't, then there's most likely an underlying medical issue that needs further investigation. But don't worry about balding in telogen effluvium because if a hair strand is being shifted into telogen phase from antigen phase, it's also being replaced by a new growing hair. So no matter what, that hair will grow back. But let's talk about more long-term hair loss. Hair loss can be caused by infectious disease, autoimmune disease, eating disorders, nutritional deficiencies, hormonal fluctuations, thyroid disorders, the use of steroids. There's so many things that can cause hair loss and its patterns show up in different ways. In men, hair loss can be caused by any of the things that we mentioned earlier, but most of the time it is a hereditary trait and the timing of hair loss within their life will be similar to when it occurred in the generation prior and the generation before that and so on and so forth. And in this case, largely hormones are to blame, specifically a sensitivity to androgens called androgenic alopecia. So in androgenic alopecia, essentially there's this derivative of testosterone called DHT or dihydrotestosterone, and it's the enemy of our hair. When it is in excess, it binds to hair follicles and progressively thins them out. So eventually they become so frail and easily lost that they fall out and over time the hair becomes more and more frail and refuses to grow back at all. Androgenic alopecia in men will most often present with an M-shaped pattern so receding hairline at the temple specifically and also thinning of the hair on the crown. But in women you can also get androgenic alopecia and instead of the receding hairline you'll get thinning just at the crown and along the part. In women the receding hairline part is most often caused by traction, pulling the hair back too tight or over processing your hair or it can be diagnosed as frontal fibrosing alopecia. And this is characterized by progressive hair loss and scarring of the scalp, where eventually the scars that develop along the front of the scalp prevent the hair from growing back at all. The reasoning for frontal fibrosing alopecia is not yet understood, and so the best thing you can do is get at it early before those scars develop because that scar is a late stage of the condition from which regrowth is not easily possible. Another type of hair loss is alopecia areata, and that is when you'll lose hair from very concentric, smooth, circular areas around your scalp, and this is most often caused by autoimmune disease, which is essentially where the body um, is attacking itself, and in this case, its own hair. Other things we mentioned like infections, thyroid disorders, um, nutritional deficiencies, medication side effects, those like we said, can cause hair loss as well, but this hair loss will generally be more diffuse and harder to detect. To understand what type of hair loss you're experiencing, you will want to visit your family physician or your dermatologist. They will most likely run blood tests. They might 
physically examine your hair and pull a few strands out to see what the fallout is like and even possibly do a small biopsy to see what the underlying issue is. Once the root cause has been defined, then treatment can be catered towards that cause if possible. But there are things that you can do to restore the health of your hair concomitantly. So let's talk temporary solutions first. Of course, the most obvious is switching up your part. If I'm missing hair from this side, what I can do is switch my part to here and flip my hair over the area that's missing hair just to conceal it while I'm waiting for the hair to regrow. Another option is concealing your hairline or wherever else you're losing hair from with a root spray or even eyeshadow. I have quite an uneven hairline if I pull it back tight and to make it look more dense and even, I will sometimes use just a brown eyeshadow on a dense eyeshadow brush and blend it out along my, along my hairline. You do wanna blend it out though because it can be a dead giveaway if you're wearing it. And specifically for traction alopecia, for example, besides genetics and and um, aging being the cause of it, you just need to stop the traction. Stop pulling it back so tight, leave your hair down, don't brush it when it's wet, sleep on a silk pillow to prevent that resistance, um, or tie it up in a silk scarf, anything to kind of just soften what your hair goes through on a day-to-day -day basis. And most importantly, you wanna stop processing it. The hair along the front of our head is a lot more fine than back here, and so processed hair is very easy to see um, along the hairline. And I understand that it might be so difficult to deal with your natural texture of hair or your hair without your desired color, but let me tell you, it is far easier to restore your hair back to health and have healthy hair than it is to try and regrow hair once it's been lost. So now let's talk more long-term solutions. We're gonna split this up into oral therapies and topical therapies. So as far as oral therapies, we have some plant-based and we have more medical. Um, and of course, even with plant-based therapies, you have to talk to your doctor before you start any new supplement routine. But if they give you the go ahead, then you have some options. Number one being saw palmetto. So remember how I told you that essentially in um, androgenic alopecia, you have something called DHT, dihydrotestosterone is the enemy of your hair. Um, it is converted from testosterone. So the theory is if you can stop that overproduction of DHT, then you can stop that resulting androgenic alopecia, or at least diminish the intensity of it. So there's an enzyme that converts testosterone to DHT, and that is called 5-alpha reductase. So saw palmetto blocks 5-alpha reductase, blocks the formation of DHT in excess, blocks you know then the DHT from binding to the follicle and making it frail, so on and so forth. But there are a lot of reasons why you may not be allowed to use or consume saw palmetto. If you have a bleeding disorder, clotting disorder, if you're pregnant, if you're breastfeeding, um, if you have liver disease, if you have a pancreatic disease, and even if you're on the birth control pill because it will make that contraception less effective. So no matter what, check with your physician before starting it. Next is pumpkin seed oil. So there was a study in 2014 that looked at the effects of PSO versus a placebo on the hair growth in men with moderate androgenic alopecia. They saw that after 24 weeks of treatment, the group of men taking pumpkin seed oil versus the placebo had a self-rated improvement in satisfaction score far higher than the placebo group. The PSO treated group even had more hair after the treatment than at baseline and the mean hair count increased 40% for those in the PSO group and just 10% in the placebo group. And next we have Viviscal, which is an oral supplement, but it's 100% drug free. And it contains things like shark cartilage, oyster, acerola cherry, and ascorbic acid, as well as silica extracts of the horsetail plant. You take this pill twice a day for six months and the results have been phenomenal across the board. But the catch is that as much as it increases the growth of your head hair, it also increases the growth of all your hair. And those effects don't last when you stop taking the supplement. So as always, try and find A, the root cause of the problem and tackle that. And then, you know, manage with the most natural and sustainable things before turning to options like this. 
Now let's talk topical solutions. So again, we have more natural solutions and medication. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is essential oils. And there's essentially an essential oil for every hair concern. First up is rosemary. In 2013, there was a study done in mice and the study found that the rosemary actually stopped DHT from binding to its receptors on the hair follicles, preventing that frailness, the thinning, and the loss, thereby making rosemary essential oil a considerable treatment for things like androgenic alopecia. In 2015, there was a study that looked at the effects of rosemary essential oil compared to Rogaine uh, or Minoxidil 2%. The two were found to have comparable results, but the study was also looking at scalp itch and REO won out compared to Rogaine in that category. And so overall, it was thought to be the better option. The benefits of rosemary were further solidified when a 2017 study saw that the antifungal and antibacterial benefits of rosemary were more than enough to fight hair loss caused by scalp infections. The best way to avail of the benefits of REO are to add a couple drops into a carrier oil and massage it into your scalp a couple times a week. Uh, you could do it one or two times a week, that's sufficient, but just leave it on for as long as possible before washing out. Next, let's talk about peppermint essential oil. In 2014, a study compared the effects of PEO to normal saline, jojoba oil, and minoxidil 3% Rogaine. And the PEO actually showed the most prominent hair growth, dermal thickness, follicle number, and follicle depth in this group. This combined with the overall cooling effect and the blood circulation caused by the massaging of PEO into the scalp and also the properties of the oil itself, it has that nice tingling sensation. All of those factors combined found PEO to be beneficial in increasing the antigen phase of your hair. So ideally, take the rosemary essential oil and the peppermint essential oil and drop a couple drops onto your carrier oil, which can be jojoba oil, sweet almond oil, whatever you desire, and massage it onto your roots, let it sit for as long as possible, and wash it out later, and you will see your hair change dramatically over time. Finally, let's talk about medication, which is honestly the most thoroughly scientifically proven option when it comes to things like androgenic alopecia. So minoxidil or Rogaine was actually originally used as a blood pressure medication, but over time people saw that um, people that were taking minoxidil would have insane amounts of hair growth all over their body. And so it was changed into this topical foam solution that you spray onto your scalp for temporary improvement in hair growth. So remember when we were talking about androgenic alopecia and we said the hair becomes fragile and frail over time and falls out and then eventually doesn't regrow? Well, what minoxidil does is it lengthens the active phase of hair, meaning less gets shuttled into the telogen or rest phase and the hair grows for longer, making your hair look thicker. Minoxidil 5% is recommended for men and 2% for women. Um, and it's best if you start early, you will have the highest chances of responding to the medication and it's over the counter. So a prescription isn't necessary. But the cons of the treatment are that A, it's costly. It's about um, 40 to $50 for a three month supply. It's tedious to constantly apply, especially for men that are not used to doing this kind of you know, self-care routine. And also if you stop it, the hair growth also stops. So you kind of hedge your bets with this one. So those are the main kind of causes and situations in which you might see general hair loss. What we're gonna discuss in the future are things like postpartum hair loss, um, hair loss after specific infections, and also things like dandruff, oily hair, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but I will leave it here for now. Just remember that everything that you're seeing on the outside in your hair, your skin, your nails, it's all a direct amplification and result of what's going on internally. So if you maintain your mental health as much as possible, especially in times like this, if you nourish yourself with the right nutrients and take care of yourself from the inside out, it will show. It might not solve all our problems, but it will sure put us ahead of the curve. All right, that's all for now, and I will talk to you soon. Bye.